Welcome back into another edition of the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you from K-State Online, part of the On3 Network. You can uh, find us over there. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us a lot. As you can see, if you're watching us, the Twitter handles below our names, at the Real Mason V, at Derek Young KSO. And uh, you can find DY everywhere. He's going to be Powercat Game Day in it uh, this year. He's going to be doing three more again. And it just sounds like Cole and John have put more work on his plate with three more. They're like, hey, we, we do the regular show. Let's do the Patreon as well. So just loads of stuff coming your way from the hardest working man in Manhattan, Kansas. And uh, we'll, we'll preview the SEMO game now. Opening game of the season for the Wildcats. They've been really good under Chris Kleiman against FCS opponents. They haven't really messed around too much with those. It's those pesky group of five schools you got to look out for and bit Chris Kleiman. And SEMO kind of fits the bill of a lot of the other FCS schools that K-State has seen recently, where being in the Midwest, that's where a lot of these good FCS programs are. And K-State isn't scheduling like uh, West Virginia terrible FCS schools that they beat like 90 to nothing. K-State's scheduling schools that are like number three in FCS and in the, the final four every year of the FCS playoffs. Really no different than SEMO. They were a playoff team a year ago. I think final record was nine and three. Uh, one of those losses was at Iowa State last year. A uh, couple of things to get to with that, and we'll just start off the top. Offense is what is key. It is the sexiest thing on the football field because that's how you get points. What do you think will work on offense this week for the Wildcats against SEMO, where a lot could work because it's you know theoretically an inferior opponent? Yeah, I think just about anything should work. I would be probably concerned if it didn't. Uh, especially with the, the the weapons that you have, what you have coming back. But if I was going to pick just any one certain thing, it's probably the running game. Now, I, I hope that they just don't say, let's run the ball 100 times and, and get through this game because we could do that and, and probably win 60 to nothing. I hope that's not the case because I'd, I'd like to see other elements. But if there's, a, if there's an angle where Kansas State should be the most dominant and should have probably – the most ease it's with that bully of an offensive line that they have back that has a ton of starts um, already in their lap, a ton of experience, a ton of cohesion, a ton of chemistry. And then you got two great backs behind him and DJ Giddens and Trey Sean Ward. And you're, you should be able to with experience size and just caliber of play and athletes overwhelm SEMO with that element with Ward Giddens in the offensive line. My pick on offense this week, I, I would say Will Howard, like this is a game where he could, should shine in, you know, FCS team, big time quarterback like Will Howard proved he was last year, throwing it all over the place. But because there's a little bit of unknown with the wide receiver position, I'll play it a little bit safer. I'll just say the Ben Sennett, Will Howard connection is what I think is probably going to work the best this week, where you're going to have two guys that are obviously very comfortable with each other. And I think that Colin Klein will be able to get them in a position to expose some weaknesses and giant holes in the SEMO defense. And we'll probably see a pretty significant hookup between Howard and Senate all season long. But I think in this game in particular, we're bound to have a couple plays where Ben Sennett's just camped out wide open in the middle of the field. Nobody's around him. And Will Howard zips one in there. So that's probably where I'm going to lean my confidence level uh, in the offense for, for this coming week. Concern-wise, it's probably pretty easy to tell what my offensive concern is. I'm, I'm going to guess it's probably yours, too, because we know quite a bit about everything else. We know Will Howard. We know the offensive line. We know the running back should be pretty good. It's got to be at the receiver position just because there are two unknowns that are in the top three of the depth chart right there with Keegan Johnson and R.J. Garcia. Both guys have high upside, could do some really awesome things for K-State this week. But until we see it on the field, I can't put my full faith into it. Yeah, that's understandable. Mine's along those lines, but it's not like a, a concern with any personnel, so to speak. My, you know, the element where I think they could get themselves into trouble this week when playing SEMO. SEMO's probably best defensive player is the safety Lawrence Johnson. I mean, he's he's a stud. He could play on a lot of teams, not just at the FCS level, but the FBS level. That's one guy where I think you could take him off the field or you could point him out on the field and be like, you know, that's not an FCS player, even though he's on an FCS team. And, you know, if you give him an opportunity, if you're trying to do too much, which I think could be easy to do in game one, where you got 
all the, all those nerves and anxiety from having to wait an entire off season. You just want to go unleash that ball, right? And, and you just want to, you know, make a touchdown on every play right away in, in every form. Um, and don't take what the defense gives you at all times. He could probably make it make it hurt at least early. So I think if I if there was any concern, I, I don't really have one. But if I wanted to create one in my head, it would be that they have a really good safety, Simo does, and Lawrence Johnson. And if you're trying to do too much or maybe make an inappropriate gamble, I think he can he can make it cost you. You're probably right on that. And I'm going to be – you talk about gambles. That's probably the one area of Will Howard's game this year that I'm most intrigued by because last year he did take – you know, what – if you look at them, you'd say that's probably a gamble and they mostly paid off for him. I'm interested if with a new crop of receivers and just, you know, maybe luck doesn't go his way. If we see a couple of those, you know, 50, 50 type plays that he's tried to make before, maybe not work out in his favor. So it, it, it might be a little bit worrisome that, you know, if Simo has a playmaker that can make you pay on a couple of gambles, you may be alert of that, but this is a game where the offense should really shine through and really prove themselves on the other side of the ball the defense a lot more question marks for the defense going into this season especially when you consider now to start the year up front Uso Sayamalo was supposed to be a pretty big piece a little bit of an injury concern Daniel Green same type of thing at linebacker and then we we know in the secondary that it's just question marks galore about new guys working in guys switching positions guys moving up Concern that you might have for this upcoming game for the Wildcats. Concern wise, I would just be be a little worried about you know what what Kansas State can do against the pass because Simo has a returning starter at quarterback in De Laurent, and as you said, no returning starts at corner for Kansas State, and then at the same time you're breaking in four new starters total in the secondary because there's two other safeties that aren't full-time starters. VJ Payne has started some games before, but not necessarily all of them, right? He was four games last year, I believe, even though he did start the season opener. So you have a lot of new bodies in the secondary, and you're now you're trying to rush the passer without Felix and DK Izama for the first time as well. So my concern for the Kansas State defense out of the gate in game one, especially against the, a, a team that will have a returning starter quarterback will be how they defend the pass, especially since I think I remember one of the questions or one of the answers from defensive line coach Buddy Wyatt when we spoke to him um, during training camp at one point was that he believed uh, I when I asked him where this defense can be better this year than maybe it was last year. A lot of the players said we'll probably have more team speed on defense. Buddy Wyatt just thought this team would be better against the running game. Uh, you know, I, I would like to be different on this or at least attempt to, but I think it would be a little bit silly of me for, for week one to overthink this because a lot of the other guys that, uh, that are on the defense, even though that there may be, you know, some, some question marks, you look around, they're proven. They're guys that I think we should be pretty confident will go in and get the job done. Like the pass rushers, you don't have Felix and DK Uzama, but Brendan Mott proved that he was more than worthy last year. Khalid Duke has proven it in the past. Nate Matlack, there is, there's promise and hope there. There are a lot of guys that can make things happen. And linebacker, I mean, you may be with an ailed Daniel Green or, you know, limited time for him, but there are so many guys that this staff is so excited about at linebacker that I'm also excited to see that I'm not going to totally worry about that. So I'll, I'll side with you. It, it comes in the secondary just – waiting to see how K-State is able to defend the pass. And like you said, against a quarterback that is experienced, and it doesn't matter what level you play, as long as you have an experienced quarterback, they're going to know what they can make happen. So this is going to be a, a good way to start the season and kind of get your toes wet if you're the K-State secondary. And, and another area would be to maintain health for, for the rest of the year, just because yes. you, do, you do have a, a couple of those important players like Dino Green and Uso Samala who may not be at 100%. Yeah, I mean, health is another massive one uh, this week, especially just considering, you know, we, we've talked about it already this year, but this is going to be a different Missouri team this non-conference than the last one. It's a road trip. It's just important to have guys healthy for the entirety of the season, but you don't want to lose one of these games in the first three that 
you should win regardless of the circumstance, but will be maybe a little bit trickier than uh, some people would would seem to think. All right, wanna, we'll move you know, off. Oh, yeah, you, you don't want to take the air out of that balloon before we even get to the league play, which has kind of happened in in yeah, past years. Yeah. But like, and Mizzou's going to be pissed off. You're going to face a pissed yes. off football team. Yeah, no, exactly. And that's, I mean, that's a team that probably all year uh, in the off season has, you know, realized like, hey, if we want to reach a certain level of wins this year, we may not be able to do it with some of the teams that we'll have to play in the SEC. But K State's one that we'd like to get back because. I mean, obviously they were a little embarrassed and hurt feelings by that with the the late touchdown and timeouts that Eli Drinkwitz had a call last year. So I'm sure he'll want more than just a couple of garbage time scores uh, in 2023. And Kansas State kind of rubbed their nose in the, into it afterwards. So. Yes, absolutely. So we'll see uh, kind of what ends up coming out of that. Now we'll we'll go and be a little bit more positive here. What is a thing or two that you expect to work for the defense? Or, you know, I'll change it up a little bit here because this is kind of how I'm going to take the question. Um, somebody that you're really excited to see hit the field for the first time this season. Yeah, you're thinking along the same lines as me. If Because I, I don't know what will what'll really work. Maybe stopping the run because I'm just worried about more of the, about the pass in his game. But more than anything, it's about seeing those cornerbacks for the first time because you're returning zero starts. Um, you can make an argument. It could be Jacob Parrish. He's going to start. Because everybody loves him up in the, I mean, if you, if you believe the coaches, and, and I do, especially on this front, I mean, Jacob Parrish might have been the best player on the Kansas State roster throughout the training camp. But Will Lee is probably really the most intriguing as well, just because, I mean, it, it's obvious to do this just because of the physical profile, but you're kind of, we'll see if the, the skill set and all the other things kind of align as well. But it, just when you look at, them side by side he's like a julius brent's clone right he's huge he's fast he's long um you need that on the perimeter he gives you that and the fact that he probably he arrived at spring ball like halfway through and it seemed like it was an uphill climb because of that i mean it seems like he's come a long way for him to just kind of grab this starting job going away much the same way that we've seen jacob Parrish do uh desmond pernell do uh trying to think of some other guys that brendan mott right as well and, and he probably doesn't get enough credit for what he did last year and what he can provide Kansas State as well I really like what he can do but that corner yeah that's probably where I want to see the most because it man just the way they talk about him and what we know about Will Lee being close to Julius Brent's at least from a physical profile I, I think I want to see that just because I also tend to think you're going to see some growing pains also, I mean, zero career start, career starts is kind of a thing, especially when the Big yeah. 12 typically, and we'll see if it plays out this way, Big 12 typically has some really, really good wide receivers and teams that really want to throw the ball like 50 times a game. Um, luckily for Kansas State, with those new quarterbacks that they're breaking in for the first time, uh, the biggest challenge in that regard is probably Texas, and they won't have to play them until much later in the year. So you get a little bit of a reprieve from the Longhorns that probably – can challenge you the most vertically or at least challenge your cornerbacks the most, stress them the most. Um, but I wouldn't sleep on Missouri in that way. They can really do that as well um, if they have a quarterback that can deliver the ball. Yeah, yeah. If they have a quarterback that's not, you know, three straight drives, throwing it into the hands of Kobe Savage and whoever else is back there. I, I'm with you. Like, I, I don't know if it's going to work. Obviously, it's a big question mark, but I am intrigued to, to see what, the rotation of guys at corner looks like and what we see out of some of them, because Jacob Parrish is the guy that I think has probably had, you know, the most positive buzz by, you know, grabbing the job and getting it. And then Will Lee is a guy that he profiles to be like the next big important transfer addition to the secondary that Chris Kleiman has made every single year that Chris Kleiman has been here. They've brought somebody in that has made an impact in their secondary and sometimes multiple guys, and that may be the case this year, Will Lee could be that guy. And then, I mean, this is just – I'm so fascinated because of the storyline and, and how it's all come about. But seeing what Keenan Garber actually looks like at that position with legitimate reps and, you know, time to, to develop at that position, I find to be really fascinating. So when he is on the field, I'm going to be interested to see how he is trying to make plays for K-State. And not like, you know – your typical playmaking type plays. I just want to see, like, 
if there's a simple pass there that he can defend, how does he defend it? If there's a guy in open space that he is having to try and bring down, how does he make a tackle? Like, I'm just really intrigued for all these different reasons for all of these guys that are going to be in position to play on Saturday and for the rest of the season for K-State at that position. As you said, the secondary as a whole, I mean, even to see if Kobe Savage is still like that nightmare in the back yep. end, has he lost half a step? I don't think so. Most guys do, but he's also built a little differently between the years. He's a dog. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's that's one positive is that a guy like Kobe Savage, even if there is still a little bit of like physical traits that have to be built back up mentally and the way that he plays the game, he can make more than make up for it. So we'll see how it looks. I mean, a lot of questions there. And, and you know, it's because there are these newcomers, but then you just point out like the, the number one guy returning, kind of like the heart and soul of this defense at one point last year, he's having to come back from an injury that was pretty significant. So we'll see how okay. that ends up working out. Yeah. All right, uh, let's move on to the best bets portion of this. Now, look, uh, FCS school, we're not getting anything put out by uh, by the actual books right now, but I've got a couple of my own that I will throw your way real quick because I'm, I'm interested in this. And I told you beforehand, Will Howard, I have been saying all offseason long, he is going to break the K-State single-season touchdown passes record. I need him to pad his stats against an FCS school. So over or under three and a half passing touchdowns for Will Howard on Saturday against SEMO. Yeah, these are good ones. Um, see, one of my things, it probably different, we'll see if it's part of your over-unders, is I think Kansas State gets 50, 50 plus points on Saturday. So we're, we're talking seven or eight touchdowns. Like, And I really think that they're going to run the crap out of the ball too. So – Three and a half is probably right at the line of demarcation for me. So your total is really good on that front. I will go under because I think there's going to be a good share of, of running touchdowns and I don't see them playing four full quarters. And I think if they are scoring seven or eight touchdowns, which is my expectation, I think you could see Jake Rubley or Avery Johnson being responsible for one of those as well. So I will, I will go under. I think it's probably right at three. I know that's not good for your, for your, you know, the the stat pattern. But you have to remember. I mean, the single season record is only twenty something. Like, it, like this is not a shot at Kansas State, but that is a very underwhelming single season touchdown record. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the, that's kind of the point. It's like a couple of years ago when the like Mike Mustakis broke the Royal single season home run records, and all he had to do was hit like. 36 of them uh it's since been up by that Jorge Soler and Salvador Perez have hit 48 now so the Royals were like one of the last teams to never have somebody hit 40 home runs in a season they finally had that happen a couple times um I don't know I mean I think you're right like I want I want that because I you know I want my prediction to be right but it's probably under just because there are so many unknowns because essentially that means Will Howard basically in the first half has to come out there and throw four touchdown passes because he's probably only going to play up to the fourth quarter and there will be a lot of running using DJ Giddens and Treshawn Ward. And like you said, Avery Johnson and Jake Rubley will get in there. Maybe another good question then is, is does Avery Johnson score a touchdown of any kind in this game on Saturday? Uh, put your feet to the fire there because we know he's going to play as long as the score dictates it. But to what extent do we get to see his ability? I will say no. I want to say yes, but I'm going to say no. Just you know, here here's my thing. I, I I think I think actually it's probably yes, but I also think that's going to cause undue pressure on multiple people <laughs> there. So it's like, is that really the best case scenario? I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean. Probably the hope is there, and maybe he can throw the ball a little bit. But maybe a worst case scenario for the hype train is if he gets in there and he's able to unleash a pass and he hits like a big one or something. Or heck, I even remember the like little seven yard dart that Will Howard threw to Jack Stanine for his first pass against Arkansas State. I was like, oh crap, this guy, he might be something. And then, you know, I kind of turned on him there for a little bit, but I'm back on board for all of that. Uh, I think he does. Now I'm, I was wildly wrong about this because another game last year where I said, 
oh, this guy is undoubtedly scoring a touchdown. I thought it was a lock that Adrian Martinez was going to get to run in a touchdown in the mm-hmm. Alabama Sugar Bowl. Like, I just thought hey, he's back. They're letting him out there. Like, we're going to see him more. They're going to get into the red zone and use his legs. And they really didn't use him that much. So I was wildly wrong last year. I probably will be this year, but I'll say it for the heck of it. And because I can see the image in my head, you know, it's it's pitch blackout. It's, you know, fourth quarter, three and a half minutes left. They're at like the eight yard line and just a little option. And the, the golden locks pull the ball from the running back and Avery scampers into the end zone for the touchdown. So I'll say, yes, we get an Avery Johnson touchdown this weekend. Man, if, uh, if, we get a, if we get a 50 plus yard Avery Johnson touchdown, that'll be the <laughs> only thing that is discussed for the next week in, in Kansas State fan land. Because that mean, uh, Might and then, the field. Yeah, uh, it's good. I mean, the, the crowd pop. The loudest crowd pop on Saturday is when Avery Johnson goes in. Yes. I mean, that's that's yep. that's that's a lock at this point. Uh, you talk about things that were terribly wrong on last year, and you could go look at the – I think it was the season preview pod last year. Over We did over-unders on three mile, Cole, John, and I, and we said the absolute lock of the year. Now, we didn't say, say it like that, but <laughs> we were the most convinced of all the over-unders that R.J. Garcia was going to have like 400 receiving yards, and then obviously – um, he didn't, I don't know if he had a hundred. So <laughs> there's going to be things that were terribly wrong on, I guess is what I'm saying. But secondly, I do think RJ Garcia maybe get close to that this year since he is, uh, you know, an unquestioned start, starting wide receiver among, amongst the three. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how his season goes. I, you know, there's only going to be so many touches and yards in production that can kind of go around, go around. Phil Brooks is kind of the steady Eddie guy. I think Keegan Johnson could maybe surpass what Malik Knowles did last year, and, and you know, and I say that people are like Malik Knowles. I mean, you know, there there are time, there are a lot of times throughout his career where he makes you pull your hair out. That's Malik Knowles, and that, uh, especially during the Iowa State game when he fumbled at the one yard line, right? I mean, there's the, that was the probably the one moment that everyone will will take away from. But quietly, I mean, I think he had north of 600, maybe north of 700 yards last year. So. Um, Still had a pretty good season. I think Keegan Johnson, that would be one of my bold predictions I wanted to mention. It's like, it would not shock me. Now, we'll see what the clock rules do because it seems like games are a little bit shorter, maybe a possession less here and there. It would not shock me if we see Keegan Johnson get a thousand yards receiving each. Uh, Malik Knowles, 725 yards last season. So, yeah, I mean, he was he was really good last year in, in kind of, I mean, the touchdowns were the least of his career tied with his, his first season at K-State. But everything else was basically what people had been wanting and expecting from Malik Knowles for the for most of his career. So it worked out really well. Uh, I've got a couple of other quick ones here that I've thrown together. Uh, these more have to do with either what we saw last year or just kind of K-State you know, history. Uh, does it take over under uh, one and a half plays for a touchdown the first touchdown offensively for K-State this year. The under hit last year, Malik Knowles, play number one. Uh, does the first play go for a touchdown this year for K-State? I will say no, because doing that two years in a row seems like you're hitting the lottery. What I will say is Colin Klein kind of strikes me as the kind of guy that – that, but like he's like calm, cool, collected, very reserved when you interview him, when you talk to him, like the kindest guy you'll ever meet in your entire life. Like I'll probably never meet someone kinder than Colin Klein. And I would imagine that everyone that comes into contact with him believes and would echo the same thing. But like underneath all that is a cold blooded killer when it comes to football and he's aggressive and he likes to go for the kill. So it would not shock me that we see like a shot player or two in those first three or four. Last one then uh, for me here that I got for you. I, I, obviously, it's over my answer to that one. I don't think we see the first play, but I could see it being like a three or four play drive where there's a big play that, that sets it up early. Uh, the next one, do we see a special teams or defensive touchdown in the game for K-State? I can't, th- I can't remember exactly how many there were last season, um, but obviously it was the second game of the year. Uh, that Philip Brooks took a punt back for a touchdown. So what what do you say? Do we see a special teams or defensive touchdown on Saturday? Yeah, and that made me remember, and I think it was the first game, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, 
But everyone's favorite player, Jonathan Alexander, I think had a touchdown in the first game of the season on special teams off a block punt. I want to. Yes, I, I, think you, I, right? I think you're right. <laughs> so uh, they they tend to kind of do that. Look, and one of those guys that has blocked a punt already is Seth Porter. And I don't know how much special teams he's going to play. Uh, he might be the most valuable special teams player on the entire team. Uh, people remember, and I brought this up on the Three Mall podcast earlier. Um, I think it's on the preview podcast, but like the one play that everyone forgets is that that play where Seth Porter downed the down the punt in the Big Twelve Championship game inside the five yard line. So TCU didn't even try yep. to uh, score on the final possession and was just happy to go into overtime. Like TCU and the way Max Duggan was going, like they could have gotten field goal range. There was enough time there. Yep. So Seth Porter was very valuable. I will actually say yes, they do. I th- I I don't know if it's a defensive touchdown just because. I think there are some kinks to work out there. Although, if they are as fast as a defense as they they are vowing that they are, usually fast defenses are the ones that wreak the most havoc and can cause the most turnovers. So maybe that's an element that even though this defense is probably worse in areas than last year's, maybe that's the one where they can be better. They did force a lot of turnovers already last year, though. I'll say, because you say it's special teams or defense a touchdown, I'll say yes. I kind of lean towards special teams, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did have one last year in the opener, second touchdown of the year. I think it was a Seth Porter block that led to Desmond Purnell, who had a touchdown uh, against South Dakota. So they've done it before. It happens plenty of times. Um, Malik Knowles maybe took a, a kickback for a touchdown uh, in one of the first games of the season a couple of years ago. So it, I, I think it probably does happen. I think that they expose it. And I think it does come on special teams where that's typically where you can really – I mean, offense, defense, you'll see differences. But last year, it was pretty apparent that South Dakota was not going to be any match for K-State special teams. And I think we see something similar to that this year uh, with this game. Do you have any other bold predictions or or best bets that you want to throw out there before we uh, move on to to kind of our final predictions for the game on Saturday? Yeah, I already threw out Keegan Johnson, 1,000 receiving yards for the season. I bet he gets 100 yards receiving on Saturday, too. I think he gets it started off right. Uh, he's too too good for that not to happen. And I don't think he gets game planned away or schemed away out of the gate, so that might open up other opportunities for him if he's really what we think he's going to be. Um, whew, I'm trying to think defensively if there's anything bold to kind of say. I I wouldn't say bold, but I will feel I'll say this. I will feel thrilled if they hold SEMA to less than 20 points. Um, my prediction, final score, I know we were probably going to say that, so I'll just kind of step in and go for it now. Is 52 to 20 Kansas State. I think they get their 50 points that they've been talking about all season. They'd like to get the there's a big 50 benchmark because I think they got real close to that several times last year or a few different times anyway. So I think they get their 50, but I think growing pains on defense, I think is going to be the story throughout some of the non-conference. That, uh, that was one of the tough things for me was, uh, I mean, obviously uh, earlier this week, the first thing that I did for, for K-State online was my game by game predictions. I picked 44, 13 as a score for this game. I'm with you. The defense being broken in, maybe Simo sneaks a couple more points past the goalie than what, you know, you would be accustomed to in this game. But I think K-State's offense will be right, and I do think eventually uh, there's enough talent over, overwhelming SEMO there that K-State's able to uh, put them away comfortably. So I'll stick to my 44-13. I mean, offensively, I, I, I'm, I've got to roll with Will Howard for a big game because, I'm again, that's, that's my prediction for the year. I'll say it again and again. He's going to break the very <laughs> minuscule single-season touchdowns his record for K-State. It was funny last week as I was – watching USC flirt around with danger with San Jose State for a half, and they show Caleb Williams' numbers and how many touchdowns he threw last season. And you think that that is double the best in K-State football history, basically, with what he's done. So uh, I'm interested in Will Howard. And then defensively, like, we talked a lot about the secondary and those guys, but for somebody that I think is going to come out and play a really good game for K-State – I, my, my bet would go on to Kobe Savage just because he's going to have so much energy and emotion to be back out onto the field and be ready to go. Um, and again, it's, it's these FCS opponents you can kind of pick on a little bit. So I think that, you know, defensively he would be uh, my, my go-to guy there. And 
that's how I see it playing out. But should be a pretty comfortable win for the Wildcats. Uh, offensively, if we're yeah, basically like an MVP portion, I like what you did there. I will go. Uh, I say Keegan Johnson's going to have that big game with 100 receiving yards, but I think running the ball is probably where the biggest mark goes. And I think Trayshawn Ward really gets going this year, but maybe not right out of the gate because he's the newest to the system. Yeah. And DJ Giddens is just can be really overwhelming to basically an FCS size defense, I think. So I'll say, if you're asking me MVP stuff here, player of the game stuff, I'll say DJ Giddens on offense. I think he can explode on Saturday. Defensively, give me Austin Moore because I think there's a chance he's the best defensive player on the team. I'd agree with that. I I think it, by the end of the year, you're, we're going to look at Austin Moore as that guy for this team. And like, that's one of the, those things that I kind of laughed at last year when they referred to him as the machine and all this. You're like, Austin Moore, really? But I mean, he proved it very quickly. Mm-hmm. Like, he was just everywhere. The ball was there, Austin Moore was there, and he was helping him make stops and make plays. Another guy like, you know, with like Will Howard, Brendan Mott, when they initially kind of got out there or got their chance last year that people kind of scoffed at and then quickly proved that he belonged. So, you know, if you want another bold prediction, like I, I think people would say, oh, Daniel Green, all Big 12 first team. Nothing gets Daniel Green. He's really good. He could do it too. Yeah. If I wanted to make a bold prediction, Austin Moore, all Big 12 first team linebacker this year. Well, uh, everybody book it and cook it. Get get your final wagers in there. Everything DY said is gospel. It will happen this weekend. And uh, we'll be hopefully recapping a big K-State win because we want to talk about – we know about the guys that we know about. We know about Will Howard. We know about DJ Giddens. We know about all these guys that we can see in a good close game. We're really wanting to look at and talk about the guys that get to get in when – it is 50 to 20 or whatever. And we're seeing Avery Johnson or Jake Rubley out there. So we'll have a, a full recap and everything uh, on Saturday after the game, great content up on K-State online and then plenty of digital content to follow up as well. But that'll do it for DY and I for this edition of the KSO show previewing the season opener with SEMO. We'll be back. Keep following on K-State online all season.